I, I, yeah, very good, fantastic. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to take you on a bit of a. Where is my? Yeah. I'm going to take you a bit of on a tour of the force through um, Africa's possible role in tackling global climate change. We've been working on this for the last two years in a collaboration between Dalberg Research and the Climate Action Platform Africa. I'm the managing director of Dalberg Research. We're a team of 70 researchers, five minutes walk from here, so we beat the latest entrance uh, easily. And we've looked at Africa's potential in contributing to solving the climate crisis. Now, this is what most of us know from the press quite regularly. Um, Africa is particularly vulnerable, uh, two degrees of warning, significant uh, loss of livelihoods, income, opportunities. Uh, the health effects are not quantified here, but they are severe, uh, large migration and other things, and very limited buffer capacities. There is not a government spending spree that can help us to buy us out of certain parts of the crisis. And on top of that now, carbon intensive progress is um, kind of, uh, uh, carbon intensive progress is locked off for many of the countries. So you have coal in the ground, but if you build lots of coal fired power plants, um, you're not gonna be very um, well received in the global community, and there's gonna be a lot of negative uh, pushback on that. That means that the traditional pathway to development is somewhat locked off. This is how countries like South Korea, Iran, China have evolved. Um, emissions per capita in tons increase dramatically for even relatively small incomes, uh, in income increases uh, per capita. This thing is uh, moving faster than I uh, can, can possibly do. Yeah? So this, this line to the top right that many countries have gone through is now locked off for African countries unless we want to exacerbate the global uh, climate crisis quite significantly. So we need to find, either we can keep the continent poor and we can say, oh, well, the poorest need to tighten their belt uh, and then we can solve the climate crisis or we find another way. And I, we do think that there is another way. Now, what we need is something called climate positive growth. We need to have an opportunity for Africa to combine its ability to grow, um, to develop its economies, and at the same time to spearhead a net negative society. Now, there's a lot of countries that emit a lot of greenhouse gases, and we're, we're all together on that. Uh, quite a few of those already know that they will not reach net zero by 2050 um, because of lock-ins that they have that make it impossible for them. Quite a few others have committed to a 2050 net zero target, but are not achieving it, are falling behind schedule. Um, so you have an overshoot of global emissions and the common shared global goal of net zero by 2050 is only possible to meet if a large number of countries go net negative. So you're not going net zero, you're actually removing carbon from the air quite strongly. And we believe that African countries are in a prime seat to be the majority of those countries. What does Africa have? We have renewable energy potential galore. I'll come to that in great detail. Um, there is a young, young workforce by, two, uh, by, by, 20, uh, by 2100, um, the, uh, uh, Africa will be 40% of the global workforce. Um, obviously on the way going there, that workforce is growing. And that makes it an extremely attractive place to shift things that have traditionally uh, happened in Asia to the African continent, things like mass manufacturing and others. And then you have a range of natural resources. Now, this is often put up, I mean, the true wealth of natural resources, when you look at it, is in China. There's no two ways about this. This is the most resource-rich country in the world. But some key ones are quite available here, and some key ones for the uh, renewable energy transition are here. That offers three pathways for Africa and its future development to make sure we're not doing that top right development, but we're actually going straight up or straight left. Um, the first one is low emissions consumption and production. This means leapfrogging into a green economy. Um, given that most of the economies in Africa are not terribly complex and are not very large, there's a huge opportunity to leapfrog and come in with new infrastructure because the lock-in effects are much less. Um, so a much larger copy of what we've previously seen with mobile uh, communications. The second one is producing for the world. I'll come back while things like steel, aluminium, cement, fertilizer, other things should be produced in Africa rather than anywhere else in the world. 
And then there is a huge potential. Africa already hosts some of the largest carbon sinks in the world, um, among others the Congo forest. And there are many reasons why it could add significant carbon sinks and remove carbon from the atmosphere for the benefit of the world and hopefully be paid for that uh, service to the uh, rest of the world. Now these three pathways, low emissions consumption and production means that you grow in income but you don't grow in emissions. Um, producing for the world means that, you're, that other countries in the world are reaching their net zero targets faster without African countries necessarily increasing their CO2 emissions and removing carbons actually expands that box that we've previously seen by offering a pathway to going net negative. And net negative as a service for everyone together reaching uh, net zero by 2050. We call this climate positive growth. Now this collaboration, CAPA is a systems orchestrator. We're uh, trying to just identify bottlenecks uh, that are there in the ecosystem, remove those bottlenecks as quickly as possible and as pragmatically as possible. And one of the um, vehicles we do that is by um, spamming you all with data, spamming you all with real insights on the ground calculations and I'll come into that right now. What looks like a JPEG here on the right side is a geospatial model at a square kilometer grid. So those are 30 million square kilometers for Africa. If you have any questions about any region on the continent, any country, we can zoom in on everything, not in this presentation, but afterwards find me. Um, this is all built out for, for every place. Now what you see here right now is the solar and wind potential on the continent. That solar and wind potential alone is 50 times the entire world's projected energy need in 2040. 50 times the entire world's projected energy need in 2040. Now there are other places in the world that are hyper abundant in this kind of potential, um, but none as large and as significant as, uh, as this one. Why do a lot of people in Africa still not have power? The problem is not that there's a lack of opportunity for cheap power. The problem is that the anchor clients are missing. For a large energy installation, transmission lines, everything's what you need is an anchor client who helps you to um, uh, invest, to, to get the money to invest into the energy infrastructure. Now we believe that climate action can be that anchor client and therefore deliver the, deliver the capacity that allows us to make the 40% higher upfront investment that are required to connect all Africans to reliable electricity at 30% less cost, 80% lower emissions, um, uh, and 90% lower emissions per, uh, uh, per megawatt uh, uh, hour. There's a beautiful thing. So those people who come from Europe or the US typically will say, well, renewable is all nice and well, but you can't run an industry of that. The reason is because they have that seasonality and it's so ingrained in their brains that this is how solar power works, that in winter you can't use it and you need to switch something else. And then look at that line for Kenya. The line for Namibia is even more beautiful. It is a flat line and you can deliver a lot of baseload power with solar power. You can run industries that require 100% reliable uptime 24 seven with solar power in Kenya. And that doesn't work in Germany. Now for this kind of data that comes now, we, we, we worked with about um, 400 sites, 16 years of hourly data per site, actual existing wind and solar sites with known installations, configurations of batteries and solar panels uh, for 16 years uh, uh, straight. And then what you see is that the base load that the same system, if you put the same system in Kenya that you put in Germany, the system in Kenya will deliver you 10 times more base load, which is the valuable power that you can continuously rely on. The peaks are another story, but the base load will deliver 10 times more for exactly the same cost, the same system. Now, if you take the same system uh, in, into Spain, it's still Europe's best uh, solar site. It's still 2.3 times the base load you'll get in, in, in Kenya. Now the beauty, well, if you, once you calculate all this through, what you come to is basically that solar power and renewable power in Kenya is about a third of the cost that it is in, uh, uh, in Germany, for example. Um, so in a country that pushes strongly on solar, relies on solar, solar power in Kenya costs you a third because you need smaller batteries, you need lower nominal capacity for exactly the same energy needs and because of that low seasonality you can run an entire industry just on solar. 
Now, the projected prices for solar, it is the one industry that has the fastest projected price drops, the fastest uh, projected en energy gains. So these numbers are going to change very, very quickly and probably, by all our estimates, in favor of the African continent. So that gap is going to, uh, to spread. Now, what can you do with power? The beautiful about Kenya is you don't have much proximate emissions. So anything that is low efficiency will immediately be shot down in any European or American discussions because if you have a free available megawatt, you best put it into something that's currently fossil, using fossil fuels. Now, Kenya's energy mix is more than 90% renewable already. So there's not many proximate emissions. So your extra megawatt, if you put it into something with low efficiency, that doesn't matter because you can just install a next megawatt right next to it. And that means you can produce green hydrogen and do a few other things that I'm going to come to in a couple of minutes. Now, this is a map of the green hydrogen production capacity. Over 10 million square kilometers, about a third of the continent, are suitable for the production of green hydrogen. Um, a beautiful one is here that the coastal ones, the coastal sites are particularly nice because if you add pumping water out from the sea and desalinating it, it increases the energy need of the entire process by, by, by about 5% or less. Um, so it's a very viable thing to desalinate seawater and produce green, hy green hydrogen from desalinated seawater highly competitively. Plenty of land. Now this is the th first thing that blew my mind. We did this study about a year ago and this truly blew my mind. Um, Guinea is, produces about 25% of the world's bauxite, which is the key ingredient for aluminium. 98% um, of, uh, of Africa's bauxite comes from Guinea. Now, this is typically mined in Guinea, brought to the coast, then shipped, those rocks are then shipped to Asia, and in coal-fired power plants, energy is generated that is then used to turn the bauxite into aluminium. If instead you run um, the aluminium plant on renewable energy, which is truly a plug-and-play thing, it's not like steel where you need a furnace and all kinds of heat, it's truly just what is your source of power. If you are able to generate 44 gigawatts of renewable power, then you can produce the aluminium in Guinea, create about 280,000 jobs, create about 37 billion in revenue, and save 0.7% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions in total. This is 0.7%, close to 1% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the world would be cut just by this single plant. Now you'll say like, well, 44 gigawatts is kind of a tall order. It is not an unheard of order, it's not an impossible order, and definitely not, it looks, once you start looking at what else it takes to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by 1%, this is actually a very cheap and simple option um, that we can go for. Now, if you go for steel, this one is more in Sierra Leone and South Africa, you get a similar kind of uh, picture. So now the, the transition from a steel plant that is coal-fired to one that is renewable plant is a bit more complicated. You literally need to build a new plant. You can't just change the power source. But similar things, you could uh, create uh, about 200,000 jobs, 20 billion in revenue, and you save about 110 million tons. So that's about 0.2% of global greenhouse gas emissions. That's your second opportunity there. So this is the part of producing for the rest of the world. We've not yet gone net negative. This is the one I still understand least. There's some chemistry that I fully don't fully get to. But this is fully renewable shipping fuel alone. The shipping industry has a huge contribution. One gigaton CO2. That is 1,000 million tons. 1,000 million tons or about 2.1% of global greenhouse gas emissions just for switching existing boats to methanol-based fuels that are in a... Uh, uh, carbon uh, economy. Huge potential to produce that on the continent here for the rest of the world because it has very similar requirements as the green hydrogen would have. Now on top of that, we've not yet gone net negative, eh? we've just grown a lot, um, but we haven't um, gone negative, we've just not added more emissions. We've avoided emissions and we've reduced emissions from somewhere else, but we haven't withdrawn any carbon yet. Now we need to remove about 5 to 16 billion tons of carbon by 2050 uh, if we want to meet our targets because we have emitted so much in the past. So the fuel that we've burned and maybe getting here, uh, we need to put it back in the ground to uh, uh, meet our sets. And there are basically three groups that we distinguish. Nature-based, so reforestation and things like that. Engineered, uh, duck, uh, direct air capture is a big topic. And then more hybrid methods, I'll come to those as well. Again, Africa extremely well positioned to do this. 
massive untapped energy potential we discussed, limited existing uh, proximate emission, I, uh, I described that, large endowments of land, entrepreneurial workforce, and then on top of that, large anticipated infrastructure needs that allows for us that jump into a green economy. Um, there are now, we are now on the cusp of developing uh, things like cement that is truly a carbon sink. Not just by greenwashing, we're on the cusp of having true carbon sink cement. And if you shift your infrastructure projections from a carbon emitter to a carbon sink, that makes a huge difference for the continent. Now, removing carbon at scale is a huge opportunity. We've got, we developed a web-based tool here, capa.earthrise.media, um, where you can click on every country and shift your carbon price per ton and then see what that means in jobs and in revenue and all kinds of things. Uh, at $50 a ton, we're looking at $15 billion in revenue and roughly 70 million people who would benefit in their livelihoods um, just from reforestation, from protecting ecosystems, removing carbon in a, with the nature-based solutions. Now here is uh, Doug and you've got experts in the room and experts at the conference. Uh, Martin is in the back of Octavia Carbon. Um, there's a few other people in Duncan I see uh, somewhere. Um, this is removed potential now in Lake Naivasha. There is a lot of activity to make Kenya the world's leading hub for direct air capture. Again, in the rest of the world, people will tell you this is a stupid idea because the efficiency of the approach, you're just using so much energy, it's much more efficient putting that into replacing some fuel, uh, fossil fuel driven approach. We don't have those to replace. And on top of that, a lot of the energy used in this is actually just plain waste steam from geothermal power plants. And then the Great Rift Valley has some of the best geology in the world to actually store these things in the ground. So again, you have a huge potential to draw um, uh, carbon from the atmosphere better here than anywhere else. And I think most uh, global companies have also realized that and, and many of them have announced their plans um, very short term to install capacity for direct air capture on the continent. It's a tiny thing. We need an end and end if we want to meet our targets. So we also bet on some tiny things. Kenya is a world-class position for this. Here's an interesting hybrid solution. Um, basically, a third of Kenya and a lot of the surrounding countries are made of basalt rock. Um, basalt rock is often mined in quarries, and while you mine it, there's a dust that uh, uh, is, is, is uh, um, from, the, from the cuttings and things like that that you have as a residue that sits on the side. Now, if you put a truck and you pick that up and you put about 20 tons of that basalt dust on every acre of field, then what you get is a kind of mineralized fertilizer that can yield, increase yields between anywhere on, on 5 to 40 percent, um, depending on the conditions. Now, what this basalt rock does, it interacts with the rain and the sun, and it mineralizes carbon into rock. So this is not soil organic carbon that once you run a plow over it, it goes back into the air. This is rock that can wash into the ocean. It'll be there for a thousand years. It's mineralized, it's solidified. Um, and Africa, again, has a massive potential. Tanzania has a larger potential than Kenya, so there's now a research center being set up by Andu uh, in, in Tanzania. But I just also want to use this to tell you the, 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 the speed at which this happened. Um, the National Carbon Removal Workshop here was about, I believe, almost uh, nine months ago, something like that. Two weeks before that, the Andu leadership team for the first, first time, time heard about, heard about Kenya. Kenya. Two, weeks Two weeks later, later they, were they were there, there at the National, National Carbon, Carbon Removal, Removal Conference. Conference. Two months, Two months later, later, we shipped, we shipped out the first, first trucks, trucks for the field, field trials. trials. And, now, and they're now they're setting, setting up national, national collaborations in Tanzania, in Tanzania with, with the research center and everything. This is one, one year. year. Not, Not even, even one year. year. So this, so this is, is also, also there's, there's a regulatory environment, environment there's, there's a willingness, a willingness to, work, to work, there's an ecosystem, ecosystem where, people where people are extremely, are extremely fast, fast and proactive. I think for, for, for Octavia, Octavia and some others, also the timelines that they're working on are crazy compared to the rest of the world. It takes much, much longer elsewhere. Anyway, significant potential now for the removal of carbon. Now, if you take it all together, I want to highlight two numbers that are up here. Um, the first one is by carbon removal, just by the poor scale of what is possible, we can grow the global carbon budget by about 40%. So you can kind of offset, compensate four other countries that are not meeting their targets to quite some extent. Now, we don't want to make that a loophole or anything. There's many things that are going, and getting to those 40% is a big story. You can't sit in the rest of the world and say, well, Africa is going to take care of this one. Um, now, here, we do believe that this combination will lead to a 
uh, revenue potential. And obviously here, carbon prices and global regulatory things that we're also working on um, are, are a big issue. But a number of tenfold African GDP from 2.4 trillion to about 24 trillion is entirely feasible. And there is no assumptions that anyone has yet shot down entirely in our calculations. 24 trillion dollars. And that means that quite a range of numbers would go um, to middle income and upper middle income status on the continent. So that is what we understand as climate positive uh, growth. Um, those two numbers I want to uh, uh, highlight. And I hope I have convinced you that there is another story and that Africa truly has a positive role to play in solving the global climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasper. That was really, really interesting. Um, I know that we are going to go into the next uh, keynote, but uh, for now, I just want a quick question. Um, we talked about hydrogen a lot, but as we know, the market is not yet there. Is there one thing policy-wise that the world needs to do to create a market for hydrogen? Um, in hydrogen itself, I believe it's coming up very quickly. What we need is a fair compensation for Africa to get be paid for the tons of carbon we uh, avoid or put in the ground or otherwise. Um, currently, the African, most of the African companies will be in the voluntary carbon market. That has just grown from maybe $2 billion a year to 3 or $4 billion a year. The EU compliance market alone is $845 billion. So if we can only offset 5% of that with high quality carbon on the African continent, you've increased your market by a size of about 15 times. And um, so Africa, to get those 24 trillion, we need a global infrastructure that allows the continent to be paid for its service that it delivers to the world. Otherwise, we're going to have another round of African potential and resources being exploited for the rest of the continent without the continent being better off. And that's something that the countries should block off. And that means if that environment is there, the hydrogen infrastructure will very quickly follow because suddenly the interest rate and financials and other things make sense. Thank you so much once again. Please give a round of applause for Dr. Grosskoth. Thank you so much.